welcome to Connie Martinson Talks Books. I've never eaten my guest's food, but oh, do I love his writing. My guest is Anthony Bourdain. He has written, this is his fourth book, A Cook's Tour, In Search of the Perfect Meal. It's published by Bloomsbury St. Martin's Press. Welcome, Tony. Glad to be here, hi. And what a terrific book, what an artist's book. And, I mean, you set yourself up for all the slings and the arrows. Yeah, I guess that's a fair statement. Uh, you know, I, this was, the book was a tremendous opportunity for me to, to satisfy my curiosity and uh, fulfill, uh, you know, my desires and fantasies that I've had since uh, childhood. And, you know, as somebody who stood on their feet in the kitchen with a very small, limited parochial view of the world to have an opportunity to, to, to eat his way around the world and have adventures and misadventures, uh, it was worth any slings and arrows. Yes. We originally met on a bone in the throat. Yes. Yeah, right. which was a very honest look at a troubled kid out of Vassa who was during, I guess, the, um, the rebellious years. Mm -hmm. A few years have passed, and now we have the successful chef hyphen writer who's about to do a TV show. So when you are doing this traveling, lest anyone think you're there with a backpack, you're there with a backpack of a producer and a cameraman and all of the food channel behind you. Yeah, I, and I, it, it caused a problem for me in, in that I'd sold the book, um, I'd made my plans, and as a late edition, uh, some producers came along and said, listen, can we follow you around with some cameras? posed a real problem as far as the book. I mean, I, I can't exactly talk about uh, sitting on a mountaintop and, uh, you know, looking out at a great vista and not mention that, well, there are two people floating around with cameras. It changes everything, of course. So I tried to use them as uh, comic foils whenever possible. Yes. First place you go to is Portugal. Uh, yes. Uh, it won't be on the show that if people are watching the TV show, the book is out of order or the show is out of order. Yes. But you had heard about cooking the pig from the man you were working for, Jose, mm -hmm. at Les Al. Yeah. Uh, I think I call the chapter Where Food Comes From uh, because, uh, you know, I've been a chef and a cook for 20, about 28 years now. And in all of that time, I've, I've been, you know, ordering up my meat over the phone, like uh, you know, like uh, Al Pacino and Godfather too. I pick up the yeah. phone and something dies somewhere else. This was the first time that I really had to look my meal in the face. Yeah. And um, yeah, I was a little squeamish and uncomfortable about it, frankly. I mean, it, which is only fair, I'm sure. But uh, basically, a whole village turned out and they slaughter a pig, which had been fattened for me for six months, and then used absolutely every part to make something wonderful. And to see the, the different place that food holds in different cultures is kind of a theme in the book. What is interesting is how you as the writer describe it that comes off almost like a Hieronymus Bosch painting or bacon or uh, uh, apropos, mm -hmm. but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, from London and uh, even Freud there. It, it was pretty horrifying uh, yeah. to me. Um, and yet I turned at one point, I'll never forget, and the kids, the, the, the kids from the, the farm where this was going on just had placid expressions on their faces as if, uh, you know, nothing was going on at all. Um, I mean, as I, I said in the book, I'm sure seeing a cow being milked or, uh, uh, you know, similar uh, uh, country matters, as they used to say, uh, I would have found similarly difficult. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's what you get for being a city boy. There is a lovely chapter where you and your brother rediscover your past. And all, it's a little bit of you can't go home again. Mm. But it also was you and your brother bonding. But where in France? Well, you know, I would had my first really important culinary experience in France, my first oyster. I had a lot of happy memories and, and a, a lot of over-romanticized notions about my childhood and, and, the, and particularly the food I ate there and context. And I thought that kind of by recreating that, those childhood moments by bringing my brother over, going to the same places, eating the same soup, going to the same place for oysters, that magic would automatically happen, that I was, I was sure to have a perfect meal. Um, and ultimately, I was, I was disappointed. There was a missing ingredient. Yeah, the fact you weren't 10 anymore. Yeah, <laughs> big ingredient. <laughs> and also, you said about your father, because there's a wonderful sort of passage where you talk about him. 
and uh, the fact that he isn't there anymore with you. And I, as, as a matter of fact, I wonder if I could ask you to read just a little bit of it, which was, my father was to me a man of mystery. My father was to me a man of mystery. He probably would have been pleased to hear that as he considered himself, I think, a simple, uncomplicated sort of a guy. Though warm, sentimental, and passionate about things like literature, art, movies, and especially music, his appreciations ran deep, so deep that what I always suspected was his true nature, that of a secretly disappointed romantic, was nearly out of sight. Thank you. Um, there's more, but they'll have to read that. Yeah, but you read it very well. Are you doing Thanks. it on an audio tape? Uh, done, yes. So the, the audio book and all its yeah. various configurations, yes, I've done yeah. that. But in France, you do finally get to taste the soup again that you had been trying to uh, replicate. Yes, and I make it better now. That's, no, it was wonderful. It was just the way I remembered it, but not as good as my own. Well, because you added the lobster to it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that helps. Um, yeah, it was a curiously unsatisfying uh, wing. And in fact, having eaten my way through, well, broken every traveler's warning you can imagine as far as you know, what, you put it, what to not put in your mouth under any circumstance, you know, all around rural Cambodia and Vietnam and Mexico, Russia, uh, and elsewhere, the one place that really brought me to my knees, just absolutely destroyed me, uh, near death ill was France. Uh, really? <laughs> yeah. No shortage of irony in this book. Yeah. And of course along the way we're not just eating. We are imbibing. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I was often the guest of honor at, at, a, at on farms, in, in home, you know, poor people's homes, uh, or at restaurants. The host or my host would often be right there offering, giving me the best they had. And it would have been, in my opinion, unspeakably rude not to take whatever's offered. I mean, I was there for the full ride. How many times am I going to get to go to, to Vietnam in my life? How many times am I going to be able to sit down with a bunch of former Viet Cong war heroes in the middle of the jungle? So when they break out the rice moonshine and everybody wants to do a shot with the visiting American, I felt compelled uh, to, well, take full advantage of this magic moment and also there's a competitive urge. <laughs> All right, Vietnam, as I said to you, I just was there in November. Did you drink that wine with the snake? Snake wine, yeah. Yeah. I must say, you know, I thought it was just a one shot when I saw it, but wherever you went, yes. there was that wine bottle with El Snakeo. Often in with it. a bird in plumage uh, entwined by snakes in there. Uh, as it was explained to me, it's a sort of a counterpoint. I don't really understand it. They said the bird is the enemy of the snake, so this is very good wine. Okay. Um, what did it taste like? I mean, is it a um, Chardonnay? Is it a boy, you know, Burgundy? Rice wine. Uh, yeah. Not offensive at all. Uh, not, not bad. Uh, God, I, I wish that was the scariest thing I, I had in my travels. N oh, no. Not even close. No. The worst to me is when you are there and they give you f guest of honor grub. Yeah. I mean, that closes the I, book, I, so it had to mean, or it comes close to the end of the book, that you were getting ready to leave the uh, primitive. Mm -hmm. It's... Uh I ate, I ate a number of frightening things. The, the, I was not ready to see the grub. The grub itself cooked, not bad at all, but they, they present it live. Yeah. Uh, and uh, having, as I just, you know, been having the full Cobra meal, uh, I really wasn't in, in the mood for that uh, second course. Well, I have to say, when we were in China, um, you know, unless it barked, I didn't ask what mm -hmm. was the consistency of this wonderful food I was eating. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm... I really went out of my way to eat as much as I could and pretty much whatever was offered and take full advantage of, of what I saw as an incredible opportunity. San Sebastian, your wife is there with mm -hmm. you, Nancy, and I love the fact she was ready to haul off and sock the cameraman or the producer where they kept putting her out of the uh, camera sight. Yeah. Uh, she's hated the whole idea of television from the from the from the get go, and the idea of me even being on television. You know, anytime I'm on television, in fact, you know, I'll, 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 sometimes I'll flick it on, and she's like, "Aren't you sick of yourself yet?" Oh God, uh, which helps keep me sane. So she, yes, she's my harshest critic, and was not thrilled that two people walking backwards were accompanying us everywhere. 
How did you two meet, and how long have you been married? We've been married 16 years, met in high school. Really? Mm-hmm. And it was great, one of those great off and again, on again things until we got married 16 years ago. Uh -huh. Children? No. Yeah. Did right. she cook also? Or? No. No, yeah. it's uh, the, the, yet more irony. The chef's wife uh, is uh, not too adventurous in the food department and uh, certainly not, uh, has a, a limited repertoire of, yeah. of you know, meatloaf, grilled cheese sandwiches, not too much else. Opposites do attract. Uh, I, yeah. I think so. But San Sebastian is with the women. That's mm -hmm. really food and the women. Yeah. And how, as you said, ask a chef what's the sexiest thing about a woman, and it's a white woman in a white chef's uh, jacket, uh, burnt fingers and scars on her hands. Yeah, there's a toughness. It, you know, a lot of information is transferred, communicated between chefs by their hands. Uh, you know, calluses, burn marks, things like that are kind of badges of honor. So it's, an, it's impressive, particularly I'm impressed by seeing, you know, women line cooks, women chefs. I know the cost. I know what, the, what, what price they paid to. It's harder for, for, for women. It's a very male, uh, closed society and, and, and it's been hostile to women for years. So, you know, just seeing a woman chef, uh, it, you, you understand, uh, you know, how hard it's been for her, what an accomplishment mm -hmm. it is. And, uh, you know, I'm, I find that, a, you know, an attractive and interesting quality, you know, somebody that strong yeah. and uh, who's been facing adversity for so long successfully, especially as in this case, someone who's working at one of the, the chef of one of the best restaurants in the world. But there's also the woman who had been a lawyer in Vietnam. Oh, Madame Dai. Yeah. That, that was just at, right out of Graham Greene, that, 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 uh, that whole experience. A uh, you know, little old lady in a black dress and her hair up in a bun, Vietnamese. Uh, she had been the first uh, female lawyer in, in Vietnam under the old puppet regime, as they were called. And when the, the North uh, you know, took over, uh, they shut her down, but they allowed her to, to keep operating as a cafe. Uh, though heavily monitored by, of course, by the, mm -hmm. by the police and the security organs, walking into her dining room, which is her old law offices with the, with the dusty books and pictures of her, her old friends, Mitterrand, you know, the Pope, General Gap, uh, you know, Ho Chi Minh, this incredible collection of spies, mercenaries, diplomats, all of whom have, have eaten. It was just a step right back into 1954. It was magic. Most people do not know that Ho Chi Minh was at one point a chef, not a, a well, a sous chef. I mean, mm -hmm. I'll call him a chef to a chef. He may not have been a chef in Paris and then in Boston at the Park no, House. No, he was a favorite of Escoffier, it is said. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the Listen, if you king become head of a government, you're anybody's favorite whom you worked with in a different field. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I have a certain sympathy for old Uncle Ho, you know, a fellow cook. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but I was shocked, and I do know you were too in the book, you talk about it, the poverty in Ho Chi Minh City. Mm -hmm seeing children sleeping on the street in the daytime, seeing the, uh, well, as you said, that, that man who's fa who was really not recognizable mm -hmm. almost as a human. It is because Vietnamese food is the best. It's the best yeah. of France, it's the best of China, and it is remarkable. And then suddenly your appetite is lost. That threw me. It really, th it was hard because it was the first of first experience of that kind for yeah. me uh, on the, on, in my travels. But I have to say the difference between Vietnam and Cambodia, where it really got me down. You know, Vietnam is a proud country. They're poor, but, but they're fiercely proud. And mm -hmm. um, they're proud cooks, they're proud people, they're industrious, uh, they persevere, and there is a se there's not a sense in any way that they're defeated by their poverty. Uh, if anything, they, they are proud of all of the adversity they've, they've faced over the years. And, and to my mind, uh, their food is an expression of that uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. I mean, I had a great time in Vietnam. I just felt madly in love with the whole country. Cambodia, they do not, to my understanding, from what I saw, they, they, do, they don't have the luxury of pride yet. They've been just knocked down on their knees. Um, if they were left with knees after, after all they've been through, and you know, it, 
they just don't have that, that luxury of pride because they've just been shafted so terribly from every direction and continue to be. Uh, I had a very hard time writing about food or much less making a food television show in Cambodia. Um, so I had real mixed emotions about that country. I mean, it was very exciting, and I had some very scary Midnight Express moments there. Yeah. Hopefully it makes interesting reading and viewing. <clears throat> but uh, I was really saddened by it. How long did you spend there? Uh, a couple of weeks in Cambodia, a couple of weeks in, in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You did have government uh, approval. You did have government... In Vietnam, yes. Yeah. The, yeah. You know, finding a government in Cambodia is you know, an accomplishment as it kind of changes every 10 yards in 10 minutes. Um, Vietnam, actually, we, you know, our, our escort, because we had cameras, mm -hmm. we had to have a, you know, a handler translator who, of course, was admitted to reporting to the People's Committee every day. Yeah. He turned out to be a party animal. He let us see everything that we wanted to see. Uh, you know, he'd yeah. ask us, please don't shoot the, uh, the, the gun emplacement. That was mm -hmm. about the extent of it. But he showed us things that I was really shocked he, he let us see. I mean, really, you know, struggling, poverty, inequity, um, uh, things that would clearly one, one would not, uh, the, you know, a worker's paradise would not be proud of. Yeah. And he introduced us to some wonderful people who, who were nothing but, but generous and, and, uh, and, and delightful. Uh, you also go to Japan and uh, try the poison fish. I mean, mm -hmm. if you bite it wrong, goodbye? Yeah, I think it's, I was, I thought it would, I had high expectations there. I thought at least I'd get a you know, kind of a buzz or a little, you know, a little pain, some numbness. Yeah. Uh, it was very bland uh, from what I saw of its preparation. Well, I saw it prepared step by step. They're very, very careful. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's minimal risk. Uh, but I found the taste kind of disappointing. I, I really expected more. It was a bit of a letdown. I love everything else about Japan, though. I mean, I have fun every time I go there. It's a, it's a chef's paradise. Why? They value food. I mean, it's almost a mania there, particularly seafood. I mean, it, I, it's like going to Cartier, going to the fish market there. You just see people grading gems. They grade tuna like that. And yeah. They'll pay anything, it seems, and for, for, for good seafood and their excitement uh, and appreciation mm -hmm. of food and the amount of time and, and the seriousness with which they, they approach it, um, you know, you, really leaves an impression. But they don't have New England lobster or Maine lobsters. Uh, yes, oh, I'm sure they do. They, they, yeah. they pillaging the seas around the world to get seafood. If it's good, they've got it. Oh, what is it? The Portuguese, no, this uh, Basque man who said to you, we really discovered America. Yeah. <laughs> we went over there, got the cod. Why would we tell the Portuguese or the right. Spanish? It was right. great because, you know, the Portuguese and the Spanish, of course, say the same thing. Yeah, well, we, yeah. we discovered America. He just said that. Yeah. Yeah. What about the cod in San Sebastian? Um, it, of course, it's wonderful. Uh, they, in San Sebastian and in Portugal, they take their salt cod very seriously. I mean, it was, it's the foundation of, uh, you know, of their cuisine in a yeah. lot of ways. Um, interesting you brought that up because it's a perfect example of, of food or, and dishes born out of necessity, mm -hmm. uh, poverty, and real need. Uh, that long after that need, day-to-day -day need, has disappeared, has become a beloved part of a really glorious cuisine. And I, you see that again and again and again. Uh, food that people don't have to eat anymore, uh, that the, the need has long disappeared, but is now a cherished staple. Now, there is a funny line here, though, when you're in Morocco, and part of your preparing for this series is we should have a whole live lamb Mm -hmm. And through the years, they'll sell you a leg of lamb, they'll sell you a chop. But where's that whole lamb you want roasted by the blue men? Yeah, well, we had to go do the job ourselves. That uh, <laughs> I was, when you want, as I often found, when you want fresh meat or poultry in yeah. the third world, uh, you know, we were thinking about I, some of the crew on the sh show were joking. You know, you need your own catchphrase. All the other chefs have it, and we were thinking, you know, when Tony gets hungry, something dies, because uh, that happened a lot. <laughs> yeah. You know, I got on my camel in Morocco, and I had to pat him on the head and said, I don't know what you've heard, but, you know, you're safe, man. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> Carry me where you will. Yeah. But when the man says to you, listen, I don't know if you want to pay this, $100 mm -hmm. for a whole lamb, and you said, 
New York, that's not two out of line. Right. I mean, that's for two with two chops. Exactly. So, yeah. uh, you know, we got the whole beast and uh, hauled them out into the desert, and the blue men uh, cooked. They, in a, in a big uh, mud oven, dropped, put them on a skewer into a hole. They also made bread for us, uh, you know, it, it buried in the sand. That was exactly the sort of cool cinematic uh, childhood Tintin fantasy that I, you know, been looking yeah. for. Uh, Especially since you had had the good fortune to have somebody get you some hash and cigarettes, which, I mean, I'm not revealing anything because I wouldn't know it if I didn't mm -hmm. read the book. And I thought, I do hope Tony was smart enough not to try to take any of this out of the country oh. into another country. No. <laughs> Those days are gone. No, no, no. Yeah. But, you know, of course, I, you know, I read Burroughs and, uh, and um, Balls Express, and, uh, you, said. you know, all of that. So, you know, went in, you know, uh, the, the, the appropriate um, uh, local specialties I always tried to sample. That's good. But you said how difficult it was to try to tape that night and make any conversation. I um, mean, let's say the word stoned. Yeah. Uh, not that I was any better at uh, being a TV host, sober. you know, sober, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. or any happier about it. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, it's, it's a show with a point of view, that's for sure, um, and it's certainly unlike anything else uh, on Food Network. But I, you know, I had, and I think it's obvious uh, when you see the show, I had very mixed emotions about it. It's a very manic depressive show. When I'm happy, I look happy. Yeah. When I'm miserable, I look miserable on the show. I'm not the cheerful, smiling, informative host at all. And in the book, at the end of every sort of long chapter, is another reason not to do a television show. There, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I didn't want the reader to forget uh, because they're going to find out later. Yeah. You know, I didn't want anyone to read this round the world. Uh, you know, my adventures, not having mentioned cameras. Um, and then see the show and, and, and just feel that it, it in some way feel betrayed. So yeah. I want to constantly remind people not only that, that I make a television simultaneously here, but uh, that I'm not enjoying it sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I will say in Moscow, I mean, with who was it, Elena? There was the woman who brings you and you Yeah, have I think I Cranberry. called her Svetlana in, yeah. the, uh, in, in, the, in the book. Uh, that, she was great. Cranberry uh, vodka. Yeah, uh, a woman, uh, basically a working class woman from a working class neighborhood who, uh, you know, took me to her home and cooked borscht and pelmini and, uh, and just the caviar. fabulous. caviar. Tell me about the caviar. Um, the everyday caviar there is not so great. You, you, you basically are given the choice in most restaurants of you want the red or you want the black. Um, but the food there, in general, was much better than uh, than, than I expected. Uh, as good as the laundry. That was an, maybe the most incredible restaurant meal of my life. I went with three other chefs, twenty about twenty courses, six and a half hours to eat, and I was just uh, all of us were absolutely dazzled by the the care, the attention, the creativity, uh, the seriousness of intent. It was. Uh, pretty close to uh, a perfect restaurant meal. I don't, I, I don't know that you could hope for, for better. It was, what was the main course? Oh, God, there were so many of them. Uh, it was, yeah. You know, there were three or four meat courses. Uh, I can you know, barely remember it. Yeah. I, you know, the most memorable course for me, of course, was the chef, Thomas Keller, had read my previous book, yeah. Knows I'm a Degenerate Smoker, and halfway through, uh, there was a little uh, tasting course, and mine arrives. It was a uh, Marlboro infused coffee custard, and it was called coffee in a cigarette. And uh, <laughs> I was very embarrassed, and I thought it was, you know, yeah. really having me on. But it was in fact delicious. It was tobacco infused uh, coffee mousse with a little slab of seared foie gras in it, as I recall. It was just a very a very funny moment, a, a kind of a painful one for me, but like everything he makes, delicious. <laughs> All right, um, one other. Where do you go next? Um, I'd like very much to go back to Vietnam, and I'd like to spend some serious time there. I would like to do a Vietnam book. Mm -hmm. um, I've always 
yearned in my secret heart of hearts to be Graham Greene. Never will be, but I'd like to at least. Yeah. Have you been to Thailand? No, I'd, uh, I'm like Laos, Central Highlands of Vietnam, and North yeah. Vietnam are, uh, interest me very much. Yeah, because Bangkok has some marvelous restaurants, having just also mm -hmm. on that Vietnam swing. And Singapore, which is as clean a place as you can go, I found the food a little antiseptic. You know, a little honest dirt is no impediment to a great meal. That's if I've, I've learned that lesson again and again and again uh, on and my travels. And a little unhappiness and a little sort of disgruntled author can at times make a terrific book. Tony, thank you. Will thank you, you so autograph much. my book? And if you'd like a copy of our newsletter, Good Books, send me a stamped, self-addressed envelope to Good Books, P.O. Box 69, 1640, Los Angeles, California, 90069. Email us at www.talksbooks at lycos.com. We'll tell you about some other books we've liked recently. Look for our column in the Beverly Hills Courier. And one of the books we'll tell you about is a book, Lest We Forget, September 11th, 2001. This is a book of photographs that the pictures tell the story. Any of us who saw it that morning with the first plane coming in that could have been what we thought was oh, a terrible accident, followed by that second plane, that this was no accident, this was terrorism. Were you there at the time, Tony? I was in Manhattan, yes. Yeah. Did, did you know, what did you, I mean, how did you comprehend what was happening? I, I, it'll be 10 years before I can. It's still an open, it yeah. still hurts, it's still an open wound. Uh, you know, I think like all New Yorkers, I'm both shaken to the core and never so proud to be a New Yorker yeah. as, as I am now. And of course, in this book, you take off the cover, and there are just some of the names, the faces of those innocent victims. It's a horrendous book. It's a record. It's done by the New York Magazine, and uh, just one of the books we've liked recently, only because it's Lest We Forget. Meanwhile, support your local library. Go in. There are great cookbooks from, oh, French gourmet magazines and French, uh, the original, what was it, the gourmet cookbook that came from France, every bride got, as well as... Um, all of the early books that are include Clay, uh, Clay, Craig Claiborne. Craig Claiborne, thank you very much. Sixty Second Cooking by Pierre Frenet. Uh, wonderful cookbooks. I mean, I'm just their names will not be forgotten as long as you can eat their food. But that's all in your library. So support it, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's fun.